Representative Hoyer is chairman of the Commission of Security and Cooperation in Europe, which goes by the acronym CSCE. His topic tonight is CSCE, its implications for a new world order. As you may recall, Congressman Hoyer was elected to the House of Representatives in a special election in May of 1981. He has since been re-elected in 1982, 1984, 1986, 1988, and most recently in 1990 with 81% of the vote. In 1989, he was elected chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, the fourth ranking position in the House Democratic leadership. He is also a member of the House Appropriations Committee and the Steering and Policy Committee. Prior to his service in the Congress, he served in the Maryland State Senate from 1966 to 1978. When he was elected president of the Maryland Senate in 1975, he was the youngest person in Maryland history to hold that position. In his role as chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, Congressman Hoyer has been deeply involved with the Helsinki process for nearly a decade. Recently, in his role as chairman of the CSCE, he led a 13-member congressional delegation to Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, where the delegation met with all three Baltic presidents. Thence, the group went on to Moscow for talks with Boris Yeltsin. Additionally, Representative Hoyer has just recently returned from the Middle East, where he was able to discuss with leaders in Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait the idea of the CSCE process serving as a model for the Middle East. We are pleased to have him as our guest tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce him to you now, Congressman Steny H. Hoyer. Thank you very much, Sheila, for that introduction. I uh, am impressed with uh, the fact always that Frank says we start promptly at 6, and I always worry that I will be there at 6.01, and uh, the speech will be uh, uh, over. But I am pleased that I was on time, and I see all of you were as well. I want to thank you because uh, it's always an honor to be invited to speak uh, to this uh, group. It is a group with whom I had, uh, many of you, much more contact in my former life than I do now. Uh, as I am all the way over in Washington, way away from uh, Baltimore. But I'm always pleased to come back. I'd like to begin by thanking you again for inviting me. Uh, the impact of foreign affairs on all of us and on our day-to-day -day lives has certainly been driven home to all of us in recent months. I commend uh, the work of this organization, which reflects that reality and has for many years. During the past year or so, global developments have painted an amazing picture of rapid, stunning change in Europe, the unification of Germany, and the end of the Cold War. Turning points celebrated by last November's CSE Paris Summit uh, in November, uh, where the Charter of Paris was signed by the President and by 33 other heads of state. It exemplifies the most promising of the history-making events to which I referred. And now, today, we are celebrating, perhaps, the end of the war in the Persian Gulf, a war in which the United States forged an unprecedented coalition of forces, in which the United States achieved unprecedented cooperation among the members of the United Nations, and in which the United States and its allies realized an unprecedented military success. Is it any wonder then, in light of all this, that politicians, the press, and even some pundits have proclaimed the founding of a new world order? And indeed, there can be no question that we have a very different world order than we had when I first joined the Helsinki Commission in 1985. But it is still, as we note daily in the papers, a world with disorder and disputes, a new, a new world that is every bit as challenging as the old one. 
What better illustrates this than the experience of the three Baltic states? Microcosms, I suggest to you, of our new world. Last February, Lithuania conducted the first free and fair multi-party elections to take place in Soviet or Soviet-occupied territory in at least four decades, and maybe one would say seven, and maybe one would say ever. Subsequently, Lithuania took the historic step of declaring its independence on March 11th. Just two days ago, or perhaps yesterday, Georgia took a similar step. The two other Soviet-occupied states, Latvia and Estonia, rapidly followed suit. The importance of these events should not be overstated, but certainly not understated either. For over 70 years, the Kremlin assiduously practiced a campaign of assimilation and Russification throughout the Union in some cases brutally stamping out any vestiges of nationalism which challenged the Russian-dominated center control and which could not be used to Moscow's own ends. Violent, destructive wars of occupation were executed in the Caucasus and in Ukraine in the 1920s and in the Baltic states in the 1940s. Nationalist struggles were crushed in Central Asia and other regions under Soviet control whenever they would periodically surface. And yet, suddenly it seemed, Mikhail Gorbachev was prepared to let the three Baltic states pursue a path of self-government destined to lead to their complete and total independence from Soviet control. This, indeed, was a new world order. How far, all of us must have asked, certainly uh, Landsbergis, Gorbanovs and Rudels asked in the presence of those three republics, how far will it go? In January of this year, the brakes were put on. While our military experts were focused on maneuvers in the Gulf and our diplomatic experts were focused on maneuvers in the UN, Interior Ministry forces engaged in a brutal crackdown in Lithuania and Latvia, leaving over a dozen unarmed civilians dead in their wake. In February, as Sheila said, I led a bipartisan Helsinki Commission delegation to the three Baltic capitals to examine firsthand democracy under siege. Concrete barricades protecting the parliament buildings meant to house freely elected legislatures. Occupying tanks and armed personnel carriers aimed at publishing houses and TV stations. Anxious citizens who had placed their hopes in the democratic process now confronting its fragility. With each of our interlocutors from the Baltic capitals to Moscow, my delegation reiterated what I believe is the commitment of the citizens of the United States and our government, a commitment to the rule of law and to the fundamental principles of the Helsinki Final Act. Although some commentators saw in this crackdown the end of the New World Order and a return to the Cold War, I am not yet prepared to make that judgment. For while the events in January may smack of old Stalinist tactics, the response of the people is surely of a different era. The response of the people throughout the Soviet Union was to send a message to Moscow, and that message has been clear. Such brutality will simply not be tolerated. When my delegation met with Boris Yeltsin, the chairman of the largest and most powerful republic in the Soviet Union, he unequivocally condemned the crackdown as a violation of the Union Constitution. Indeed, in talking to the presidents of the three republics, particularly Mr. Landsbergis, he attributes to, the, to Mr. Yeltsin uh, his early intervention and in speaking out about the brutality and illegality of the actions uh, in January. Uh, Landsbergis attributes to him the reason that that brutality stopped and that Moscow reconsidered. In Red Square, additionally, an estimated 100,000 people protested the lawless action of the Black Berets. Other demonstrations of solidarity with the Baltic people, 
ranged from rallies organized by the Islamic Democratic Party in the North Caucasus to protests staged by coal miners in the Kuzbas region. The Soviet Union's actions in the Baltic Republics mark a significant failure to comply with its CSE commitments and perhaps a turning point in the process of reform and democratization. That is why when it occurred, I observed on the floor of the House that that indeed may well have been a much more important event uh, than that which was going on uh, in the Persian Gulf. While the turning point in the process of reform and democratization that may be happening in the Soviet Union warrants our concerns, it does not warrant our resignation that history is about to reverse itself. For many years now, the CSE has served as a vehicle for holding its participating states to the pledges we have made to each other, and it must continue to do so today. We must be encouraged and inspired, I think, by the Soviet people themselves. Indeed, the Soviet Union, when I speak of their commitments adopted in Copenhagen at the second uh, conference within the human dimension, the third of which will be held in Moscow this September. We adopted what I had offered in Paris on behalf of the United States the year before, uh, a premise of the right of peoples to have free elections to determine the policies of their government. As you know, in the Helsinki process, uh, policies are adopted by consensus. That is to say, if any one of the 34 signatory states, then 35 signatory states, because East Germany was still a separate entity, then no policy can be adopted. So the Soviet Union itself, under Mikhail Gorbachev, adopted the premise of free elections. There is no doubt nor denial within uh, the bureaucracy in Moscow that the elections in Lithuania and Latvia were free and that the legislatures are, in fact, representative. Increasingly, it seems to me, uh, they are shedding their fear, and I speak now of the Soviet people, born of decades of repression and openly demanding by the thousands, last week uh, being the most recent example, demanding that their government's compliance with the CEC CSC pledges, which it has freely undertaken. Under such circumstances, the ability of the CSCE to facilitate compliance is unquestionably enhanced. And as the Václav Havels and Lech Valences of the world so often remind us, the CSCE has already played an important role in this process. Hopefully you heard the extraordinary speech delivered by the poet, philosopher, president of Czechoslovakia, before a joint session of the Congress of the United States. It was extraordinary in many respects. It was not really a political statement. It was a philosophical statement uh, within uh, the context of which he uh, really pointed the finger at uh, the people of uh, the Czech and Slovak uh, nation and said, perhaps we sat back and did not play a more active role in bringing freedom. But he said clearly the CSE, the Helsinki process, was the most significant uh, act which was taken by the West and the East to encourage over that 15-year period that it took, long but inevitable, I would suggest to you, uh, to realize what the Helsinki promises were in August of 1975. Most importantly, as I said, it has served as a framework, as Havel said, which the nations of Europe could man maintain a dialogue and build cooperation at a time when they were bitterly and seemingly irrevocably divided by physical and ideological barriers. Its ten principles guiding relations between states, sometimes called the Decalogue, exemplify the careful equilibrium which has given each country in the region a vested interest in participating in the process, despite the barriers which have divided them, sometimes very greatly. While Principle 1 provides for a sovereign equality of states and Principle 6 mandates non-intervention in internal affairs, Principle 7 requires respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, 
and instilled citizens with the idea that states were accountable to the governed as well as to each other. While Principle 4 speaks to the territorial integrity of states, Principle 8 recognizes the right to self-determination of principles of peoples. And Principle 1 states that borders can be changed peacefully and in accordance with international law. These are principles which are all at issue not only in the Baltic states, the Soviet Union, and Eastern Europe, but as I'm sure all of you well realize, in the Persian Gulf as well. Even with the tremendous changes which have taken place in Europe, the wide range of issues embraced by CSCE continues to give every player in the region some stake in the CSCE game. I might say, uh, parenthetically, uh, as Sheila said, I just returned from, uh, well, she said the Middle East, but I also just returned from Madrid, where the CSCE process is entering into a new and I would suggest to you perhaps as dramatic a phase as it has been up to the signing of the Charter of Paris. In Madrid, the 34 signatory states came together and created, which was suggested in the Charter of Paris, a parliamentary body, a group of parliamentarians to meet within the CSC process. And one of the most dramatic things that happened in Madrid as we considered, uh, Donny Fussell and I, and uh, eight, nine other, on behalf of the United States, and nine other nations sat uh, to bring together a draft document which had to be adopted by consensus. And as the Soviet Union, as the chairman of their Foreign Affairs Committee and the uh, Supreme Soviet sat there, they agreed to a majority rule. Now, it's a majority of all the members, which will be 245. So an absolute majority, but an majority rule in terms of policymaking within that parliamentary assembly. That was just this past uh, Tuesday, uh, a, week, a week ago Tuesday. So it is to say to you that the Soviet uh, Union under Mikhail Gorbachev is still articulating uh, their move towards democratization. Based on these experiences, I believe that CSE type process might also serve to facilitate security and cooperation in other parts of the world. And particularly now, I refer to the Middle East. The problems confronting that region of the world are obviously, uh, to all of us, immense and daunting, and have been intractable over the decades. It is a region marred by history of violence and characterized by deep-seated animosities, disputes over land and borders, ethnic antagonisms, religious intolerance, Today, the conclusion of the Gulf War has given renewed impetus for us and others to address the underlying problems in the Middle East. All of us read uh, of Secretary Baker's most recent uh, trip uh, and yesterday's occurrences. The conclusion of the Gulf War should give us renewed hope that there is an opportunity but that opportunity is in the short term, I believe, not in the long term. We may now have a chance to address effectively these problems with a view to their long-term solution if we act now. And that is why I believe Secretary Baker returned to the Middle East so soon after being there initially. Last month, I, invited, uh, I visited Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait as a member of a delegation headed by Majority Leader Gephardt and Minority Leader Bob Michael. Clearly, if a CSE-type process is to work in the Middle East, its agenda must be shaped to reflect the issues which are of particular concern there. I referenced, however, and would remind you of the principles of which I spoke, and I would ask you now, as you remember those principles, to see how applicable they may be uh, in the Middle East. But some things, I believe, should not be changed. First and foremost is the understanding that governments are accountable to each other, as well as to the governed for their treatment of their citizens and for their violations of internationally recognized rights. And now I refer to the Persian Gulf again. We've won the war of liberating Kuwait, but all of us know a different war continues. Saddam Hussein is now using his position, more importantly, his helicopters, and his remaining Republican guards 
to wage a desperate battle against the forces that oppose him, Kurds in the north and Shiites in the south. This time, American forces are standing still, and American voices are relatively silent. The people of Iraq have risen against Saddam Hussein because they have no other way to remove him. No elections, no recall vote, no chance to impeach him. They are trying to gain control of their lives in the only way they know how. After being encouraged by the United States to challenge Saddam, Saddam Hussein, they must now feel clearly abandoned. Here, however, we must make one thing clear, not only to Saddam Hussein, but the entire world. The wholesale massacre of civilians is not an internal matter. If the Helsinki process stands for anything, in the aftermath of World War II, it is that how a nation treats its own citizens is very, very much the business of all the world. Our perceived indifference to the gassing of over 5,000 Kurdish civilians two years ago sent, unfortunately, I think, a very tragic signal. We must not send the same signal today, either in the Baltics or in the Middle East. It is the appropriate concern of the world under the provisions of the Charter of the United Nations. It is the appropriate concern of the world under the Geneva Conventions. And it is the appropriate concern of the world as a fundamental matter of basic humanitarian values. It is true that we may be limited in how we can address this issue. Clearly, a military response on our part cannot answer every problem, either in the Baltics or in the Middle East. But we can seek to work with our allies in the CSCE, in the United Nations, and in other fora to find an appropriate response. We cannot, we must not, and I believe we will not, simply dismiss these acts as internal matters. Yes, I believe there is the possibility of a new order. And I have suggested that we have seen evidence of a new order. But we have not yet realized a new order. It is not set in stone. It can be shaped and molded, for better or worse, by the actions we in this country and that collectively the nations of the world take today and tomorrow. And if we want our new world order to prosper and thrive, we must be prepared to send some very clear signals regarding our expectations for what it should be most importantly, what it, for what it should be. Most importantly, we must stand by the basic principles which have guided us in this new order to begin with our belief in the fundamental and inalienable rights of human beings. In August of 1975, August 1st, when President Ford signed the Helsinki Act, he said that it would not be judged by the promises it made, but that the, by the promises that it kept. Vaslav Havel said that it had, in many respects, kept its promises. And we have seen dramatic change in the Soviet Union, in the world order. That dramatic change was evident by the effort in the Persian Gulf when we were allied with, essentially, our former evil empire described adversary of the Soviet Union. And essentially, from start to finish, the Soviet Union stayed the course. Will they stay the course for democratization in perestroika? I don't know. Perhaps none of us in this room know. Is that essential for the realization of the new world order? I think essentially most of us would say yes. Uh, as I work uh, with the CSCE, as I propose a CSCME, that is a conference on security and cooperation in the Middle East, 
which I believe has much merit to it. If you are in Israel, it has the merit of adopting the principle that I spoke to you of, of the inviolability of political borders, to be changed only by political means, not by military means or by force. It has uh, for Israel the realization that in order to create a conference on security and cooperation in the Middle East, all of the nations would have to accept the premise of the existence of the sovereignty of those participating states. It has, I suggest to you, for the Arab states, the principles with respect to self-determination of peoples and human rights. Some of them may uh, have real problems with that as they relate it to domestic politics in their nations, but certainly as it relates to the Palestinians, they may well think and believe, and properly so, that it is an item to which they can point as they talk about the rights of the Palestinians. These are, as I said, and all of you know, incredibly difficult uh, problems that confront the Middle East. But I suggest to you, if you look back to 1975 and you recall the opposition of the conservatives in this country and the severe criticism to which President Ford uh, was uh, subjected when he signed the Helsinki Final Act and was perceived uh, by most conservatives as a sellout to the Soviets, as a recognition of a peace treaty in effect de facto of the end of World War II, recognizing the then existing political borders. Few, if any, believed that the basket three, as it's called, and the principles that I have referred to in my speech would make the impact that Havel and others ultimately have concluded that it did have. Think for a moment, perhaps, if we could encourage, if we could bring those Arab states, and I would suggest that the parameters would be from Egypt uh, to Iran, within that uh, east-west uh, context, and Israel, Think, if you will, the possibilities that could come about if those nations would sit down together in a CSCE-like context, requiring consensus so that no nation can be forced to do anything against its will, but in a public forum to discuss what have become, essentially, international norms of conduct, most recently evidenced by the creation of that coalition to pass those resolutions, to create that coalition, which was arrayed in the Persian Gulf. I would suggest to you that CSE has been a great success in the European theater and the North Atlantic European theater, and that it has great possibilities in other regions of the world, most specifically the Middle East. Thank you very, very much. I think that most would agree that the CSCE probably has been much more successful than, than people would have thought at the beginning, and certainly very few American leaders have had a uh, closer look at it than you have, and so we're certainly delighted that you have first of all shared your insights uh, about that process with us, and your speculations about its applicability to the Middle East are, are, are fascinating. And I think with that and other things in mind, uh, we're eager to ask questions. The question, I believe, is whether with that in mind uh, you would comment again on your views of the role of the United States in any kind of a collective security arrangement in the future. First of all, uh, let me say that I'm not sure that I would accept the premise. I understand what you're saying about uh, Vietnam and uh, Grenada in particular. Uh, Panama may be a, a more difficult example that you raise, but I, and I understand what you're saying. When I refer, however, to the internal, uh, interfering in the internal affairs, historically, in the Helsinki process, the United States has repeatedly raised the issue of human rights uh, in signatory states, most specifically, of course, the Soviet Union, but Eastern Europe uh, clearly as well, and indeed, uh, uh, other nations uh, 
uh, Turkey being one. Uh, our allied state, a NATO member, more difficult to raise human rights criticisms about, but clearly, as uh, uh, all of you know, significant mistreatment of the Kurds in Turkey, uh, significant mistreatment of prisoners. But at any event, the internal affairs uh, uh, are, are not necessarily military. Uh, all, all three examples that you raised are obviously military interventions. They are, however, the discussion. That's what the Soviets were objecting to. And they would say, essentially, don't talk to me about Andrei Sakharov. How we deal with Andrei Sakharov is our own uh, affair. That is an internal affair. It is not the subject of international debate and discussion. The United States, uh, the NATO allies, the neutrals, there, are third, there, were, there, there were 35 nations, now 34 nations. Uh, there were 12 neutral and non-aligned nations that were neither in NATO nor in the Warsaw Pact, which of course now does not exist, uh, which made up the 35. The Albania is the only European state that was not included. The fact of the matter is that the neutrals and non-aligned, the NATO-allied nations, all believed and adopted the premise that discussion about how a nation treated its citizens was very much an international issue. I mentioned that in my speech. Why? None of us, of course, can predict, but had we had, in 1930, a Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, and you'd had congressional delegations traveling to Germany in 32 and 34 and 36, I choose even years only for purposes of illustration, and had seen developments there and had brought that to light on the international, uh, in the international debate. Uh, perhaps, only perhaps, we would have avoided a Holocaust. None of us can predict. But it is essential, and it is the premise of the Helsinki process that the Soviets now agree with, because the Soviets criticize us. Treatment of our Indians, treatment of the African-American community, our homeless, of women. They have, in effect, adopted our premise. Gorbachev was wrong. Time was, I mean, uh, 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 Khrushchev was wrong. Time was on our side. Ultimately, the premise that that was not an internal affair was adopted. Uh, so I think uh, that is the context in which I spoke about interfering in the internal affairs. Uh, military intervention is, is, is really another issue. I'm talking more about the political international debate. Yes, sir, at the microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Steny, I'll, try be, I'll try to be briefer in answers after that. Thank you. Steny, thanks again for coming up. And you notice I say, Steny, since you and I are from the same congressional district and I've been voting for you every two years. Uh, let me tell you, I don't few. care what my <laughs> folks at home call me, just as long as they vote for me. Yeah, that, yes, sir. Well, I just hope when they finish carving up the state of Maryland on this next, uh, on this last census, that you're still my congressman. <laughs> well, I but, share that. Right. But anyway, uh, my question is this. On this new world order, much of what we're seeing today seems to be an expression of self-determinism by people who want to be independent, people within uh, borders of established uh, countries. Uh, and I'm wondering why the uh, U.S. government can not have a policy in which you could all agree, Republicans and Democrats, Congress and the President, in which we support these movements of independence, whether it be the Baltic states, uh, or if Czechoslovakia wants to divide into two countries, or the Palestinians want a homeland, the Tibetans want their country. Uh, in general, why we can't have a policy that would support that? And in particular, I'm wondering about Kurdistan. Why can we not now, coming from a position of strength where we are in the Middle East, redraw the boundaries that the British apparently wanted to draw at the end of World War II there's an article in the Wall Street Journal today that points out that Kurdistan actually uh, began in 401 B.C., if you have to go back into history. Why can't we go ahead and draw that boundaries, let those people have their own country, and then take it from there and let that be our general policy? Do you want to repeat that question, or shall I just take it from there, Frank? <laughs> I, I think the question is, why can't the United States have an absolute policy supporting self-determination? And the specific example was, why can't we draw boundaries for a Kurdistan? Yes, sir. I think we do have an absolute policy 
for self-determination. Beyond that, it gets fuzzy and very difficult. I don't know who wrote that article. I can't think of his name right now, but I presume I talked to that same reporter today because he called me up from the Wall Street Journal and asked me about uh, what my view was of the administration's uh, handling uh, of the Soviet Union as an entity. Uh, you heard we met with Yeltsin in addition to the Baltic states. First of all, let, let's adopt one premise, or, or uh, from the United States standpoint, something is very clear. We perceive the Baltic states to be different than the other Soviet republics. We perceive them to be different because we recognize them as independent nations uh, in the 30s, 20s and 30s. We do not recognize, and in fact, Yakovlev, uh, one of uh, who was used to be close to uh, Gorbachev, had a report that he presented to the Supreme Soviet in December of 1989, adopted some 1,400-plus votes to 200-plus uh, against, a, a document which said that the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Treaty was invalid, and that therefore the incorporation through that method was void from the beginning. However, the Soviets now rationalized that, of course, the uh, legislatures of the three Baltic states voted to become members of the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union. Of course, all of us know that we, the United States has never recognized that because they were occupied at the time. So, first of all, the Baltic states are not are, are separate and apart, and it is the United States policy uh, carried out in fits and starts that they are independent, in effect, occupied states. Moldavia makes the same claim because, of course, they also were affected by the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, treaty. Uh, the Ukraine uh, makes a similar uh, claim. However, the United States, with a policy with which I agree, makes a differentiation. Now, with respect to the other republics, the other republics are claiming, Yeltsin being the leading proponent, that the Soviet Constitution says that a republic can vote to secede. It is difficult, however, for the outside world to tell a nation whether or not under its system a region can withdraw from it simply because we have a very strong policy of self-determination. And why does it become difficult? Where do you draw the line at self-determination? For instance, if somebody, if some uh, uh, group of uh, people occupy the oil fields of Texas, say the King Ranch, decide they don't like being taxed by Texas or by the United States. They don't have to decide that. That's a given. <laughs> they don't like it. Right. And they vote to uh, have self-determination. That is to say, they self-determine that they want to be the, uh, the nation of uh, the King Ranch. Is that the kind of self-determination? I think most of us would reject that. Now, where, do you, where is the line? Where does it come? There are 25 million Kurds in Turkey, in the Soviet Union, in Iran, and Iraq. They have a history. As you know, the administration sort of went up to the uh, autonomous region concept and has now uh, backed off it a little bit. I personally believe that that is a... Uh, uh, a solution that makes some sense. Why is it difficult? It's difficult, first of all, the Turks aren't sure that they want that. And they're an ally of ours, we're helpful during the war, so you've got a political problem with one of your allies. Should you compromise your principle because one of your political allies doesn't uh, agree with what you want to do? The simple answer is no. Uh, do we know that we always do in some respects? The answer is yes, we do. Uh, the bottom line question is this, it seems to me that the international community, not just the United States, the international community has to come up with, hopefully through the United Nations, uh, some relatively clear principles as to when self-determination can be recognized for a country or a region to withdraw. Yugoslavia, of course, now I suppose is the best example, even a better example in some ways than the Soviet Union, uh, of a country that, whose centrifugal force mm. is now driving its republics apart. Uh, but I don't have a hard and fast answer for you. The principle is hard and fast. The application of it right. is much more difficult.
But the first, first part of the question was, would you comment upon uh, Mr. Yeltsin as a uh, serious leader? And secondly, comment upon the future of the Soviet Union. First of all, let me say that uh, I have met with Mr. Yeltsin for approximately two hours. Uh, that does not, by anybody's judgment, make me an expert on Mr. Yeltsin. Uh, I've met with a lot of heads of state, and in comparison, Mr. Yeltsin seemed serious, very able, uh, conversant with all the relevant material and facts uh, that he needed to be as the head of the Russian Federation, Supreme Soviet. Uh, his reputation as he left the United States was not a particularly good one. Uh, Steve Muller invited me to a luncheon in Washington, D.C. and asked me to bring Dick Gephardt with me. I brought Dick Gephardt with me, and Dick Gephardt and I waited for an hour and 45 minutes. Mr. Yeltsin did not show. Uh, I don't know how long the speaker waited, but the speaker informed me that he had a meeting with Mr. Yeltsin. He didn't show for that meeting either. Uh, however, not however, because of that, I was somewhat suspicious is not the right word, but on guard and inquisitive on how Yeltsin would come across. As I say, he came across to me very much uh, on target with respect to what his country was about and what it needed to do. And let me say, however, that I am not at all convinced that he wants to be, that he aspires to be, uh, the Central Soviet Union leader. I think he aspires to be the leader of the Russian Federation. Uh, he's 60 years of age. Does that mean that he is not going to want to, at some point in time, replace Gorbachev? Uh, is that possible? I don't know. But I think at this point in time, that is not his objective, in my opinion. His call for Gorbachev to resign, uh, I think, reflects his attitude that Gorbachev is unable and unwilling. Unable because viscerally, I just don't think he, uh, he wants to see the empire break up under his watch. I think that's one of Gorbachev's main problems. Secondly, I, we met uh, with Gorbachev in 1987 in April for about another two hours. And you may recall the comment that he made, which dealt with putting African Americans in effect in their own republic, if you will, in their own state. And because he said, you know, we don't have nationality problems. The reason we don't is because everybody has their own republic. Essentially, as you know, the republics are organized along uh, ethnic nationality uh, basis. I don't think Gorbachev had an understanding of how deep he is the only one of the few Soviet leaders who never worked or lived in one of the republics. He's essentially a Moscow figure. Now, Yeltsin, I think, wants Gorbachev to resign because he thinks that he's not going to move quickly enough on the economic front. And I will give you a good description uh, that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, Brzezinski, former uh, national security advisor, testified before the Helsinki Commission and in describing the problem with Gorbachev's economic policy, he said it's somewhat like the British deciding that they're going to drive on the right-hand side of the road. The problem is they decided that cars would drive on the right-hand side the first week, buses the second week, and trucks the third. It's causing somewhat of a disconnect. The Soviet Union long-term policy, or future, it seems to me is tied very much to the fact of whether or not they can come to grips with their economic reforms. Shatalin had a 500-day plan. Gorbachev rejected that as a politician. But as the Brzezinski analogy, I think, reflected, you now have the economic systems warring with themselves. Now, they've just had, as you know, the ruble for the first time now has a, uh, an exchange rate that's uh, uh, effectively the black market rate, which means essentially the real rate. Uh, I think the future of the Soviet Union, first of all, 
uh, will not be what its past has been. I don't see a reversion to the past. I'm, I don't think they can go home again. I don't think they can put the genie back in the bottle. I think one of the reasons for perestroika and glasnost, well, one of the reasons for glasnost, not so much perestroika, was that the leadership made a, a determination that technology had outrun their ability to compartmentalize information. And therefore, I don't think they can go home again. I think uh, uh, democratization uh, has caught on. That's why 100,000 people dare to come out. And while the Soviet troops, uh, uh, in support of Yeltsin, and while the Soviet troops, they don't really engage one another because it's no longer the, uh, hopefully, maybe I'm being naive and, and overly optimistic, uh, the uh, hit them on the head, throw them in jail psychology that maintains even in the army. So I see the future as different than the past. We do not yet know whether it will be de uh, a democratic future, and we do not know what kind of uh, uh, hegemony uh, the Central Union will have. I suspect that uh, in the relatively near future, we will see the Baltic states uh, separated because I think the international pressure will be such that uh, ultimately they will decide that that uh, is preferable. Uh, where they will draw the line, of course, is on the Ukraine, Kazakhstan, I would presume, certainly uh, the Russian Republic itself, uh, perhaps Georgia, notwithstanding that. And Georgia, I think, is probably the most volatile uh, republic right now because they're the most militant uh, right now, and they're larger than any of the Baltic states. Uh, I think the future is, uh, is not predictable, however, and therefore I won't uh, deign to do so. If you had asked me if I had spoken in uh, December of 1988 and you had asked me to uh, uh, portray the world in December of 1989, I would have missed the mark very, very badly. In retrospect, I am sustained in that observation only by the fact that everybody else would have missed it very, very badly as well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Congressman Hoyer, I'm glad that you recognize that the Baltic states and, and Lithuania in particular are independent nations and have been recognized as such by the United States, although it's somewhat distressing that in statute after statute that's been passed by our Congress, whenever the Soviet Union is defined, it's defined as including the Baltic states. Uh, as an independent nation, Lithuania has the, the right or should be allowed to um, join in the CSCE, and I know that you recognize that. Could you comment on the possibility of it ever occurring? Mm -hmm. let, me, uh, let me first comment on the whatever statutes. We have recognized in, this, in the Helsinki process the, the existence of uh, de facto the borders. It is a de facto recognition only, not a de jure. We do not recognize the legal incorporation in any respect. Some nations do. As a matter of fact, Sweden does and Spain, where I just was, uh, do. Uh, most of the European nations do not. Uh, with respect to the status of the Baltic states in the CSCE, I believe that at minimum they ought to be granted observer status. Uh, the Helsinki Commission urged that for Paris, uh, to which the Baltic states made application. The French originally uh, did not accord them observer status because they could not do that uh, in an ex parte way, unilaterally. They, however, did accord them visitor status, and they set special seats up for them in the hall in Paris. Uh, the Soviets uh, objected strenuously to the French, and the French, very frankly, by uh, a little bit of a ruse, got the, uh, the uh, representatives out of the room, and then they indicated that because the Soviets objected, they could not come back in. To grant observer status within the CSCE requires all of the 34 present signatories to agree. That is the rule of consensus. It is probable, maybe inevitable, that the Soviets would object. And therefore, it may well be impossible at this point in time to grant them observer status. But I was disappointed that the administration in Paris did not support the asking 
of observer status. Since that time, since Paris, President Bush and Secretary Baker have indicated, uh, hopefully in some small part because of our urging on the Helsinki Commission, uh, that we would support observer status for the Baltic states. That does not, we have not moved, however, to the position where we would propose observer status. Now, I had an opportunity to speak at the Madrid conference where we uh, created the parliamentary assembly that I discussed earlier. In that speech, I suggested that the parliamentary assembly ought to consider granting to the Baltic states observer status. Uh, that parliamentary assembly will meet in July of 1992, and prior to that, I will be re recommending that. Prior to that, however, much prior to that, there will be a meeting in Geneva of the Helsinki, uh, uh, in the Helsinki process, uh, where we are going to again urge the administration to accord to the Baltic states observer status, and indeed to the foreign minister's meeting that will be in uh, uh, June of this year. Mr. Issa. Let me just add, the reason for doing that, quite obviously, is to uh, heighten the international perception of the independent status of those nations. Do you agree that the public is entitled to a transcript of all of the conversation between our former ambassador to Iraq, April Glasby, and Saddam Hussein, do you happen to know if the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is working to get that? And if not, do you think there's any other way that the public can possibly get it? I think the, the question was about Ambassador Glasby, you know, the controversy about what she did or did not tell Saddam Hussein with respect to uh, the border dispute that uh, presumably was the uh, reason uh, for the invasion of uh, Ku Kuwait and what the U.S. reaction would be. Uh, clearly what happened was uh, Ms. Glasby was placed in a very difficult situation because uh, uh, in effect she was made the scapegoat uh, in, in some respects as if we sent a wrong signal or no signal or a soft signal or a positive signal that we didn't care that that was between two Arab states. Her testimony, of course, as all of you know, before the committee uh, indicated that that's not what she said and that's not what she indicated, and that, in fact, the edited transcript that the Iraqis uh, uh, had uh, uh, released was inaccurate. Now, your question, do I, the, the Senate committee is trying to get uh, that transcript, as I understand it. The administration uh, from uh, and I'm not always supportive of the administration, as probably some of you know. Uh, I suppose, however, the administration is uh, driven by a bigger picture uh, in some respects. And that bigger picture of, is, of course, that uh, if foreign leaders knew that their discussions with uh, uh, ambassadors uh, would be transcribed, they know their reports on them, uh, transcribed uh, and would be released uh, at will, uh, they perhaps would be much more reticent than we would like them to be in discussions with our representatives. I suppose that's one concern. Secondly, uh, we may also be concerned that we might be not as forthcoming ourselves. We may not want to say some things that we would then see in a transcript uh, later on. Essentially, it's sort of like executive privilege. You're concerned that the conversations between the executive and uh, ministers in the executive uh, will not be as candid and open as they ought to be if you have absolute uh, uh, opportunity to have those public in the future. Having said that, general principle, I think in this instance they ought to be made public. And I hope they will be. And I Thank think the public's best uh, uh, I don't think you'll get it through the Freedom of Information Act. I don't think it's covered by the Freedom of Information Act. And therefore, I think the public's best bet at getting those transcripts is the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, getting them. Thank you. Yes, sir, at the microphone. Right. <clears throat> Congressman Hoyer, is the United States setting a good example for the Middle East, Pakistan, India, China, Brazil, by insisting on continuing the competition 
in weapons of mass destruction with the Soviet Union. The evidence of that is the uh, nuclear testing program and the Star Wars program, which the administration insists on and which the Congress continues to fund. Well, I think, I think you could answer that uh, perhaps, no, it's not setting a good example, but I'm not, uh, respectfully, I'm not sure that's the best question. Uh, that is to say, what we are developing ourselves. I think the much better question and the much greater concern and the policy that I hope we focus on within the context of the United Nations is uh, the arms that are sold, not necessarily the research that we do here or the arms that we produce uh, for uh, internal control and use. That's a, that is an important issue and it is an issue we need to deal with. Uh, but I think an immediate issue is, as we all know, the Iraqis received much of their material from the Soviets, from the Chinese, from the French, some technology obviously from us, uh, and, and many others. Edward Lutwak, who I'm sure some of you know, a very colorful speaker, uh, says that we ought to have a meat axe uh, arms embargo from Marrakesh to Bangladesh. Now, that's very colorful whether one can implement that or not, or one would want to implement that. In talking to Moshe Ahrens, uh, that trip I took to two weekends ago, Ahrens' uh, comment was there ought to be an uh, arms control. We ought not to get a lot of arms in here. And if an arms embargo means that Israel gets no arms from the West, uh, so that uh, no other nations get them from the West in the Middle East, then so be it. My own view, that is the most important question. As chairman of the Democratic Caucus, I hope to work with the leadership, uh, with uh, uh, Les Aspen, uh, with uh, Dante Fassell, and with others, to affect a policy of uh, uh, international constraints as it relates to the arming uh, of other nations. I think that's a, uh, arms proliferation is going to be one of the big issues in the Middle East and in other parts of the world, but particularly the most relevant question as it relates to the Middle East. As you know, the administration has already discussed uh, sending additional arms to Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, uh, other nations as well. And of course, we're going to be under pressure from our, our allies, the Syrians, uh, now, uh, which we have not historically uh, uh, done, but now that there are so-called allies, I am hopeful that we will view them uh, as cautiously and as suspiciously as Assad deserves to be viewed, notwithstanding their participation. I, uh, I should note it's always a special pleasure to uh, have Representative Hoyer with us. He's been a dues-paying member of the council longer than most of you, going back to the very early days of this council, and he presently serves on our board of trustees. And beyond all of that, I think he's given us a thoroughly informative and uh, very interesting evening. Thank you very much.